Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the organizers. Um, yeah, same, along the same lines, we come from an architecture background. So as, a, as designers, architects, and urbanists, we believe that uh, space is not only a tool for, uh, to sort of analyze the human condition, social condition, but also possibly to introduce uh, progressive change. So spatial activism is really at the core of our practice. Cluster is emerged out of specific context, uh, out of what I still call the Arab Spring. And I would like to share with you in the first few slides a bit of a background of Cairo to frame the context out of which we engaged in a number of research, mapping, but also as and design interventions. So I'll try to be fast, and I'm going to skip a few slides because I think I'm going to run out of time. So uh, Cairo is a 20 million city. Uh, it's, it's one of the largest cities in Africa and, uh, and across the globe. But as any complex city, it could be abstracted in a very basic conditions, urban condition. There are three patterns. I'm borrow David Sims' categorization. The first one being the urban historical core. Uh, it's, a, it's a city of deterioration and decay for many reasons we can talk about but it is still constitute the largest area of the city, uh, and it's also surrounded by a belt of sprawling or informal or, or, or encroaching informality, mostly on agricultural land to the north and the west of the city, and they constitute around two-thirds of housing stock. So the majority of urbanization in Cairo is informal, without architects, without planners, out state state framework. And the third pattern is new cities, new desert cities, built on uh, the desert as a state response to uh, informality. There's been four generations of cities starting from the 80s, and now we're building further east of this boundary a new capital. So the uh, deteriorating urban core, uh, and this is um, the desert cities. As you can see, it's a very automobile-driven American suburbia. And then uh, a typical image of informal development, very different from uh, Addis, for example. It's much more dense, uh, more consolidated concrete frame built on agricultural land in a, uh, in a following uh, a grid of agriculture basin. So it's pretty much private land, is not squatting, but it, its illegality stems from being uh, outside of zoning regulation. So I'm gonna skip these two and jump to the problematic. So the city, as in any other African cities, there are all these contradictions uh, between the, uh, the way city represents themselves and where the majority of the people live, uh, the different sort of connectivity, but also segregation. So to, to, to build a, how, a highway to nowhere, as we spoke earlier today, means also dividing informal area into two parts. So the connectivity means also this junction. Uh, there's also a very constant reminder on everyday level that people crossing from their, where they live to where they work or their school and, and in a very bottleneck kind of uh, 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 connections. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, the city built a new ring road to, to, to create a new city limit and put uh, sort of a new boundary of for the encroaching informality. But what this ring road didn't do is to connect informal areas. So you have these instances where informal areas are kind of cut through by highways, but you cannot really get onto the bridge or the highway. You can, you can even touch it, but you can get into it. So this dramatic juxtaposition created very smart solution, informal solution, whereby citizens uh, built <coughs> steps to get from their bajaj or tuk-tuk to the ring road, take the microbus, which in turn take them to the first metro station and so on. So we have a spectrum of informal, formal uh, in transportation, but also other uh, modes of urbanization. Uh, also, the question of perception was very important. Right before the revolution, I would say most of the middle class perception of informality was limited to uh, Kodak range from their cars driving the highway and all the stereotypes and stigmatization was enforced by this very limited, uh, ungrounded experience. So, in the meantime, the city was envisioning Brave New World. This is Cairo 2050 vision of Dubai on the Nile. Uh, they wanted to build, again, the same, the same thing we've been seeing throughout the conference. Uh, so, in 2011, we had an urban revolt protesting this urbanization. Um, so, we started working in this particular moment trying to document and come to terms with this rapid political urban change on the ground, not only in Tahrir Square, but also in any other part of the city, uh, <clears throat> we, we realized that urban revolution was not limited to the main square, but it's happening on every day through a small um, encroachment on public space, if you will, as Asif Bayad said, the slow and silent and gradual revolution happening on the street level. Um, we also learned that moment that uh, this particular condition in 2011 created a temporary 
suspension of formal order. The state was very vulnerable, and security was almost absent for months. And that was for us an opportunity to measure the extent to which, when communities are left on their own to govern their own city, to reclaim their public space, how would they govern it, what kind of rule system. So we started documenting what we called a city in flux, uh, measuring uh, the different kind of informal patterns, organization structures, to try to learn from informality during this particular moment before uh, order would be restored. We also learned that this kind of juxtaposition between formal order and informal practice is happening in every side street. Um, and very basic stuff like, you know, p new er mode of urban citizenship, like, you know, people taking the streets through, through public art, but also through more substantial infrastructure projects like this particular example of a highway exit that was built entirely by community effort to connect their neighborhood to the ring road, co mobilizing resources, uh, uh, you know, know-how, um, uh, labor, and, and money, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a video, unfortunately, it didn't work technically, but once the new during that time, um, this moment is very uh, temporary, and they wanted to document uh, their, their, their acts of transformation and send the video to the governor of Cairo, of Giza, sorry, and invited him to come and cut the ribbon at, at the moment when the state was the most vulnerable and so that the, 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 ring road, the exit was formalized and became legitimate uh, because they knew eventually the state would come back and their deed could be criminalized. So we want to document these very important informal patterns so that we can also develop tools and methods for us as architects to engage in this informalization, uh, sorry, informal development. Um, there are two projects, uh, I'm gonna skip these two. One of them on street vendors. Um, street vendors for us is an important issue not only because Informal economy is almost 50% of GDP, but more importantly to us, or equally important, street vendors occupy uh, the sidewalk. And the sidewalk is a very important demarcation between the public and the private. Uh, and in cities in Europe and North America, this line of demarcation is pretty sharp. It's all black and white, and you know pretty much what you can or you cannot do in public space. In our cities, in Cairo, there's a sort of a shade of gray. It's a gray zone of public, semi-public, and everything is contested and negotiated. So what you can or cannot do is pretty much contingent on who you are, which time of the day, where you're going to, et cetera. So this kind of contingency and constant negotiation and, and contestation is something to us was an entry point to understand a much more complex issue. So the street vendor, question was for us a, a key to understand this one square meter. For us was an, an opening, eye-opening question to how the city is being organized informally through competing interests and frames of reference. Um, this is the video that's not gonna work. And then we did all these kind of uh, technical drawings of this typological section between private and private and public, uh, and also sort of trying to codify this informal pattern, what kind of distances, what kind of measures. Uh, we also measured the uh, map, the different stakeholders who are involved in this one square meter. Um, and then we also mapped the eviction campaign. So after the restoration of order in 2014, the uh, city mobilized four institutions, including the police and the army and the municipal agency, to evict street vendors, which tells you something about the significance and the symbolic significance of this particular issue. Um, I'm going to uh, skip the second example of the street... Uh, the highway exit, and talk in the last few minutes on a design project. So what we learned from this stakeholder analysis of street vendor was a tool, so how to engage uh, intervention public space by mobilizing and, and sort of engaging the interests of, of, of the neighbors. And this is important because Cairo uh, doesn't have any city council or any form of formal participatory mechanism. So therefore, to do anything in the streets, it's almost everything coming top down. You don't know who decided and why and how. So we wanted to counter that by proposing an alternative model of participation. So we looked at uh, downtown Cairo, is the colonial part of the city. This is how it looks from the postcard, network of Hausman Street. But it's also a network of back alleys and in-between spaces. And we wanted to reimagine the city through this network of back alleys or in-between spaces as a sort of a, almost a city from the inside out. Because the, these in-between spaces are not only physical containers, but they're also spaces of mitigate, mitigation and negotiation between public and private, formal and formal, but also spaces of transition and liminality. Uh, and that was very convenient when we were going through a political transition from a formal order to a one the state of becoming. So we could imagine these all these back alleys as spaces for greenways, bikeways, art festival, et cetera. Uh, 
so we started by mobilizing the art and culture uh, to catalyze uh, generation in an inclusive way. Uh, this is a, a sort of a, a image of during organizing of art spaces. And then in 2014, after we start, uh, having mapped all these uh, in, in between spaces and alleyways, we proposed a, uh, to do a, some sort of a streetscape intervention to develop, to promote a more inclusive and accessible public space. So the first thing we did was to start to engage the different stakeholders, residents, shop owners, developers, uh, different authorities, uh, anti-harassment, women's rights group, etc., and I ask each party to tell us what they would like to see and what their concerns are. And out of these contradictions and conflicting interests, we developed a matrix, and we gave it as a design brief to the design group and told them, your, your role is to design something to negotiate this multiple interest. So why here is the, the, the role of space and, and spatial intervention, not necessarily a static one, but, it def, but it's mostly a, a negotiable kind of middle ground. Um, so the, the design that we propose is to bring nature back to the city as a, as a um, two minutes away, uh, as a, uh, a green oasis. Um, of course, we had to also um, negotiate with the authority because they were not necessarily interested to hear about democratic public space, but we talked about you know, beautification and, and development of downtown. So we developed this corporate rendering. This is during the construction. It's a very simple design of uh, you know, pavement and, and uh, green uh, scape, even though it was a heritage element we managed to map. This is the final design is basically trying to develop an interface between public and private while keeping the, the, the through traffic. So this is the 10 minutes. Uh, and using the soft scape as a soft reminder between the public and the private. Uh, and then towards the end of the project, we helped to set up a committee for public space, which is also unprecedented, to make a maintenance plan and ask representatives from each building to be part of the committee. Uh, and then we stepped out. Uh, this is the project after it's finished. Uh, and um, today, after four years, uh, so we also organized a number of events to test the idea of, of uh, uh, sort of alternative activities in the alleyways. Uh, and then the community started to celebrate this space uh, on every occasion in the Eid or the Christmas, they decorate it on themselves. So this is, um, this is the last two slides. So today, as we, as we do that, sorry, uh, in the last couple of months, this is one of the historical area that next to downtown, has been raised to the ground uh, using the trope of informality, even though it's a historical area, not an informal area, and making uh, way to another one of global capital uh, real estate development we looked at earlier. And um, uh, this is image of the new capital of the highest tower in the Middle East. And, and, and the question that I would like to, to, to leave you with is two things. So the technical question, which is what are the new tools and methods that architects are not trained to do as, as architects, as negotiators, as mediators, as activists. So that's the technical part that we share with you some of the tools. But there's also a political question about whether there's still a space in countries like Egypt, for example, for civil society organization to operate, as, to carve out a third space between state's top-down model and also capitalist uh, development as we see in this project. Thank you very much.